Hey y'all, welcome to the inaugural episode of Science and Engineering in KSP. I'm your host, Andy Leonard. I'm in the final year of my undergrad studies in aerospace engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. I decided to use part of my winter break to kick off this series in which I'll explore some of the technical aspects of spaceflight and see how Kerbal Space Program measures up to reality. Johannes Kepler was born in Weilderstadt near what is now Stuttgart, Germany in 1571. He was a math teacher at a seminary school in Austria then went on to work with Tycho Brahe, who was known for his detailed astronomical and planetary observations, in addition to being slightly out of his mind. It was under Brahe that Kepler developed his first and second laws. What happened was Kepler could not reconcile Brahe's observations with the Copernican model of planetary motion, which assumed a system of circular orbits. He realized that the planets orbited in ellipses rather than perfect circles. A decade after he published the first two laws, further analysis of the data, coupled with more research into the harmony of geometry and physical phenomena, Kepler formulated what became his third law. So let's see what the laws are. Kepler's laws of planetary motion are as follows. First law, the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. Second law, a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. Third law, the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. Now, one big thing to recognize about these laws is that although they were written for the case of planets orbiting the sun, they, are, they also apply to objects in orbit about planets and moons. We'll dig into how to verify these laws in a moment, but first let's talk a little about the geometry of ellipses. The graphic on the left is an annotation of an ellipse in the context of an inner and outer circle. The central body, like a planet or star in this diagram, would be the focus on the right, and the focus on the left is empty. And just so you know what I'm talking about, here's one focus, that's the central body, and here's the empty focus. The line R connects the focus to a given point on the boundary line of an ellipse, which is the path of an orbit. And the angle theta describes the position of the radius with respect to some arbitrary reference point. In 2D coordinates, we usually take this reference point to be the right horizontal. So here. We start from here, that's starting at zero. Now in terms of orbital elements, this angle represents the true anomaly, which we'll look at closer in the next episode. If we sweep this angle from its starting point all the way around to where it started, you can say we've swept out 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. Now, if you imagine a line along this long axis here, uh, or the line through the points farthermost from the center, then you've drawn the major axis. This parameter is half of that, so we call it the semi-major axis. This other line here along the short axis is the minor axis, so you can probably guess that B is the semi-minor axis. Uh, we have one more distance to measure, and that's the semi-lattice rectum P. The semi-lattice rectum goes from the edge to the focus and is perpendicular to the semi-major axis. Now, if this measure seems a bit arbitrary now, uh, don't worry. We'll see some equations on the next slide that show how it fits in with the other parameters. Finally, let's talk about the eccentricity by looking at this set of figures on the right. First, we see a circle, which is the special case of an ellipse with zero eccentricity. As we increase the eccentricity, though, we can see that the ellipse stretches out and the foci move further and further away from the geometric center. So here we have an eccentricity of 23, and the focus is a little off-center, and here we have an eccentricity of 0.43, and the focus has moved even more. And here's 0.77, and the focus is all the way out here and, and in every case you can see how it kind of stretches out and the uh, minor axis and major axis uh, kind of change with respect to each other. Now in a future episode we'll see what happens when you increase your eccentricity to one or greater but for now let's constrain ourselves to eccentricities between zero inclusive and one non-inclusive meaning infinitely close to but not quite one. Alrighty uh, now that we have a language for talking about ellipses let's dig in and see if KSP holds to Kepler's laws. First let me be clear this isn't supposed to be some rigorous mathematical proof. All we're doing here is trusting that these equations are valid and using them to verify that KSP adheres to Kepler's laws. Uh, 
If you're interested in finding more information about how these geometrical relations were first discovered, I encourage you to do some Googling. Uh, Wikipedia in particular is a great math resource. With that in mind, let's take a look at the equations we have in our toolkit. These first three equations relate certain distances to the semilattice rectum and the eccentricity. And these first two can also be arranged to be functions of the semi-major axis and the eccentricity. This first quantity is the apoapse distance, uh, or the point on an ellipse furthest away from the focus. This second quantity is the point on an ellipse closest to the focus, or the periapse. I think it was KSP YouTuber legend Scott Manley who came up with a handy mnemonic device to remember these. At apoapse, you're afar from the surface, and at periapse, you're perilously close. I tacked on this equation for the area of an ellipse, uh, which is simply pi times the semi-major and semi-minor axis. Finally, consider these equations as applied to a circle. Eccentricity becomes zero. So disregard that, disregard that, that, that. Um, and all the distance quantities, periapse, apoapse, semi-major axis, semi-minor axis, and semi-lattice rectum, all simply become the radius of the circle. Then you can see how everything becomes equivalent, and the area becomes the famous formula pi r squared. Let's switch over to KSP and see if these equations hold. So here we are in orbit about Kerbin. Uh, Valentina has graciously agreed to be our test pilot in looking at Kepler's laws, and she's actually pretty eager to find out if they apply in her universe. So remember, for the first law, we're just going to see if the apoapse and periapse distance equations hold. Um, if you look over here, this panel, um, part of a mod called Kerbal Engineer that really should be stock because it has all this really cool information. So the orbit that we're in is just a random orbit I launched into. There's nothing special about it. Um, if you imagine this is the equator, you can see we're pretty inclined with an inclination of about 43 degrees, and we are also in a very eccentric orbit, um, almost 0.7 inclination. So let's see how the apoapse shakes out. If you remember, the distance equation is apoapse is equal to the semi-major axis times 1 plus the eccentricity. So when we do that... we get 3,657.7 kilometers. So if you look, the apoapsis height here is 3,057.7 kilometers. So where did those missing uh, 600 kilometers go? Well, focus Kerbin. We pull up the Kerbin parameters information. We see that the equatorial radius is 600 kilometers. So these equations basically measure from the center of the body, basically assuming a point mass. Um, obviously that's not true. We have a pretty big planet in the way here. Um, but as a first order approximation, these equations are really useful. Right? So what about the periapse? Well, remember for that, it was basically the same equation except we just changed the plus to a minus. So once we get that, we get 710.46 kilometers. So again, we subtract out the 600 and we have 110 kilometers thereabouts. So yeah, looks like the equations hold. Um, if we add these two distances, 657.7 7 plus 710.4, uh, we get 2a, and 2a is 4,368.1 four, uh, 4, kilometers. Divide by 2, and yeah, we get 2,184.05 kilometers. It's a little bit off just because of the rounding error, but uh, good enough. So hopefully that convinces you that Kepler's first law is at work in KSP. So now that we've verified Kepler's first law, let's turn our attention to the second. Recall that the second law states that a line from the central body to the orbiting body sweeps out equal areas in equal times. 
Now, the math used to find a lip sector area can get kind of hairy and is a little outside the scope of this series. If you're interested in checking it out, though, I'll link a relevant discussion I found on Stack Exchange. All right, so the procedure for verifying the second law in KSP, uh, we're going to time 30 second intervals of flight, see how the radius changes to get the area. Now, to get the radius, we are going to add 600 kilometers to this parameter here, our sea level altitude, to account for the radius. Uh, but if you notice, the sea level altitude is changing pretty rapidly because we're moving pretty fast. We're moving at uh, two kilometers per second here. Um, so I'm not really going to be able to write down this number when we start or stop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a screenshot when we start timing, take a screenshot when we're done timing, and then after we have screenshots from the four different intervals, I'm just going to write a quick script in Python to compare the areas. Well, as it turns out, my method was bad and I should feel bad. Um, so what happened was, as you might have guessed while I was foolishly plotting through, um, it's really hard for this second interval to make like a nice right triangle for us to do trig on. Um, the first and the third intervals were roughly equal, but the second interval was way had you know way too big an area, and the fourth interval had way too small of an area. Um, so I kind of went back to the drawing board and I was just thinking, you know, how can I express that you know these areas are roughly the same? And then I remembered um, just the handy approximation for arc length. So over here, if you look at my code. Uh, or not, I'm sorry, not arc length, um, you know, segment area. Um, so all I did, I just used the first radius from each interval, and then I got the um, degree from the change in true anomaly, which we'll go into, as I said in the next episode on orbital elements. Um, for now, all you need to know is that the true anomaly is the angle in between uh, these two segments. So like, you see this little flip book I'm making here. The true anomaly is the angle that that traces out. Now, um, so, oops, let's go back. Yeah, so true anomaly says 3.10 degrees. And that kind of threw me for a loop at first um, because there's no way it should be just three degrees when the la the next interval is at six degrees. But then I realized that there's, I don't know if you want to call it a bug or, you know, just a missed detail in Kerbal Engineer. This isn't in degrees, it's in radians, which makes sense because over here we have about pi radians uh, at apoapse and over at periapse we have about two pi radians. Once I figured out that out, I even made a comment over here. Holy cow, this is in radians. So once I found the angle, um, I just did the simple formula, one half times the radius squared times the change in angle. And to make everything simpler, I divided through by a million. So instead of square meters, we're gonna get our answers in square kilometers. Um, I have everything set out to print, so let's take a look. And yeah, you can see that in every case we swept out about 30,000 square kilometers. So yeah, Kepler's second law does apply. Now for the third law, we're just going to do another simple equation check like we did for the second law. Recall that the third law says that the square of the planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. The constant of proportionality turns out to be this quantity here in the parentheses. G is Newton's universal gravitational constant, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 with some crazy mess of units. I think it's Newton's kilograms squared per second squared, something like that. Um, Big M is the mass of the central body, so that's that here, and the little m is the mass of the satellite. 
there. Um, the first equation is arranged such that we get the period by itself over here, and that'll be that'll come out in units of seconds. Now, since the little m is typically very small compared to big M, it doesn't contribute much to the equation, and we can usually neglect it. Now, this second equation here defines the gravitational parameter mu as the product of Newton's constant and the mass of the central body. We're going to find that this parameter comes in handy to describe motion about planets and stars. And now, for the last time this episode, let's jump over to KSP to test what we've learned. Okay, so finally, um, the equation I showed you in the PowerPoint reduces to period equals 2 pi times the square root of a cubed over mu. So let's look at all of our different parameters. Our period is just about 3 hours. Now 3 hours times 3600 seconds per hour is 10,800 seconds. Okay, So that's the number that we're going to need to be close to. Um, we're going to have to convert our semi-major axis to meters so that it will mesh with mu, our gravitational parameter, which is in units of meters cubed per second squared, and it is 3.532 times 10 to the 12. So now that we have everything, let's plug her in. Uh, a cubed. Eight four nine point zero seven nine ten to the three cubit divide by three point five three two times ten to the twelve. We take the square root of that, multiply that by two pi, and we get ten thousand seven hundred ninety one seconds, which is pretty close. And but for these uh, few missing seconds that I added to make it a nice even three hour orbit um, where we we just showed that Kepler's third law does apply. So the developers of Kerbal Space Program know their science, uh, at least Kepler's laws, and how they must be obeyed in space. And so now we are going to deorbit Valentina so she can go home, a grateful nation Thanks her for her service. And I hope you had fun watching. Um, if you have any comments, uh, suggestions, ideas for future episodes, let me know. Um, thanks for kind of suffering through this with me. Uh, but I had fun, and I hope you did too. Thanks for watching.